Well, when I was a kid, I was excited about rocks, minerals, especially crystalline minerals, fossils, uh, and so much so that I would even go uh, to the geology department at the University of Iowa, because I was living in Iowa City at the time, and knock on professors' doors and uh, ask them about uh, the structure of minerals, uh, how they arose. Uh, it was really the physical sciences that I was most interested in. Astronomy also, uh, especially meteor showers, were a big favorite. In addition to those sort of self-generated interests, I think my parents, uh, especially my dad, who was a, a physician but a frustrated physicist, he always, I think, wished that there was more science in medicine. And impossible in our family to ever take a family walk without him asking questions about um, you know, why the trees were turning color or something about the hydrodynamics of the water flow and the uh, uh, river going through town. Um, always stimulating sort of an uh, inquiry uh, of, of nature. And then some teachers, uh, even starting as early as fourth grade when I had a teacher who brought a geologist into uh, the classroom and uh, started us thinking about uh, rocks and minerals from the point of view of, of uh, how the earth uh, was formed and how, what shapes the, the crust of the earth as opposed to just, you know, look at the pretty rocks. Uh, and, then, and then going on from, uh, from elementary school through uh, junior high and, and high school, always uh, some special teachers uh, at certain intervals that stimulated my uh, interest in science. Never had any interest in biology at all through uh, college, uh, majored in chemistry, and then had a couple of uh, research experiences uh, in chemistry which were very influential. They were influential in sort of the opposite way that you normally think of an experience being influential. They taught me that I didn't want to do this. So I loved the chemistry, uh, the problem sets, the uh, calculus, the, 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 the math that was involved in working through uh, problems in the physical sciences. But when I got into the laboratory, I was, uh, found that the pace of the, of the work, the tempo, just didn't suit my own personality, which is uh, quite impatient. And so uh, in many areas of uh, physical chemistry especially, one spends a lot of time uh, building an instrument, uh, pumping all of the molecules of gas out of it before you can do your experiment. There's a lot of very uh, sophisticated plumbing, uh, in fact, involved in these experiments. People spend sometimes years building an instrument before they collect any data. And uh, I became uh, quite convinced that this was not for me, which put me in the uncomfortable position of arriving uh, in Berkeley, California, at the University of California to start graduate school in chemistry, knowing that, um, knowing only one thing, and that is that I didn't like doing the research. And of course, that is the definition of graduate uh, uh, work, is to, is to do the research in the laboratory. So um, uh, it was a bit of a conundrum. And fortunately, in wandering through the halls and talking to the different faculty, I came upon a professor who also had been trained as a physical chemist, but now was studying chromosomes. Um, I didn't know much about what a chromosome was, but I knew it was very different from gas phase physical chemistry. Uh, he was bouncing off the walls with excitement about it, and um, I thought I would give it a try, and I I just loved it. I especially loved the fact that when you did an experiment, you would get uh, feedback, uh, often the same day, and you would learn something. Sometimes you would learn, you would learn that the experiment <laughs> didn't work, but at least there was this constant interplay between ideas and experiment, which would then generate the next set of ideas, and that much more fit my personality. Well, I've um, read what many uh, philosophers and scientists have uh, used for a definition of, of what it is to, to, to be alive. And I think the simplest definition is that uh, life is 
uh, reproduction and mutation, interestingly. So if it was just, if it were just a Xerox machine uh, making an exact replica, um, that's not quite sufficient for life. There has to be some variation added with each round as well. Now, of course, that concept of, of reproduction and, and, and variation or mutation, uh, you might say, is insufficient for life. But I think that's embodied in everyone's definition. Um, and then you can elaborate that and, and add um, additional requirements that a living entity has to somehow be separate defined, encapsulated, enclosed. It has to be some kind of an entity separate from, from uh, the rest of its environment. Uh, it has to be able to transduce energy. Um, uh, those are, I think, the, the fundamental uh, aspects of the definition of what is alive. When you get to the details of how living systems work, you're really back to the level of chemistry. But now it's chemistry that is informed by and, and really directed towards understanding a life process. And so I found that being able to apply the principles of, of chemistry to something that uh, was, uh, to, to try to understand something that was alive was a particularly e exciting for me personally. It's a phone call very early in the morning. I was in Boston at the time. Uh, Joan Stites and I had just shared an award uh, from Harvard Medical School that uh, is given every three years called the Warren Triennial Prize. And they made a big point at the dinner the night before that uh, many of the winners of this prize, of their prize, had won the Nobel Prize within the next 10 years. Well, about eight hours later, uh, the phone rang, and it was Stockholm, and uh, they um, uh, told me that uh, the, um, what, what had happened, what their decision had been, and they put on a friend of mine from Stockholm so that I could hear her voice and, and know that this wasn't a crank call. But there was no chance that one would think it was a crank call anyway, because the moment I put the phone down, it rang again, and it was a newspaper reporter on the other end. And Well, I forgot to bow at the appropriate time after they had uh, taken us through all of the, um, uh, you know, practice of you bow first to the um, king and queen and then to the Royal Academy and then to the um, uh, audience. And I think I was so flustered I forgot two of the three bows or something. But it's an incredible experience, obviously, and, and one that I, um, that not just me but my family, I, uh, uh, remembers fondly, I uh, brought some of the key uh, researchers from the lab and their families to Stockholm as well. And so uh, it was nice to be able to share the, the, not just the moment, but the whole week's worth of activities with some of the key people who had been involved in actually doing the, the work. Because, you know, this isn't an individual, I mean, it's an individual award, but inevitably, uh, at least in the molecular biology field, there are more than one person uh, who's contributed to the, to, to the discovery.